Hello, you history students, and welcome to Unit 10, Lesson 1, Bill Clinton in the 1990s. Republican control of the White House continues after Reagan leaves office under his vice president, George H.W. Bush. After defeating Iraq in the Persian Gulf War in 1991, Bush's popularity is very high. However, he comes into the presidency in an economic situation where Reaganomics has cut taxes for years. We've increased military spending under both Reagan and George H.W. Bush because he had to increase military spending to fight the war in Iraq. But his promise in his campaign in 88 is no new taxes. So he's promising the American people he's not going to raise their taxes. At this point, he has to. He has to decrease deficit spending which means that the government is in a situation where they're paying out more money than they're bringing in, which causes a deficit. All of that rolled into one leads to a recession or a downturn in the economy by 1992. Unfortunately, 92 is also an election year. So George Bush runs against Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton, and unfortunately for Bush... Clinton wins, and Clinton wins by a 68.8% electoral college vote. Bill Clinton sees himself much differently than previous presidents. He calls himself a new Democrat, and he means in that that he's both liberal and conservative. So he's more of a middle-of-the-road president. Under his liberal side, Clinton proposes a plan to guarantee affordable health care for all Americans. But as president, in order to get bills passed, he has to work with Congress. Clinton is a Democrat. Congress is controlled by the Republicans by this point. And Republicans don't necessarily agree with his affordable health care for all in the 90s. So they defeat his big government health reform. They really see it as the government getting too involved in a time period when Republicans believe in a lack of government involvement. Clinton also works with Republicans to reform the welfare system. He puts laws on limits Laws and limits on how long people could receive these benefits. So let's say that you begin receiving food stamps. You can't continue to receive food stamps indefinitely without proving that you still need them. And he also allows the states to decide how that welfare money should be spent, which is a good thing to the people because the states better know what their people need as opposed to the federal government who's looking out for everybody in every state. On his conservative side, Clinton works with Congress to reduce the federal deficit and balance the federal budget. Because at this point in the country, we're spending, again, more money than we are bringing in. That means that we're what we call in the red, which means that we don't have enough money, we're in debt. And by 1997, Clinton cut government spending and lowered taxes, which actually leads to a surplus for the first time in 30 years. And a surplus is when you have more money than you're spending. Think of it in terms of a regular American having disposable income. You're making enough money to where you can pay all your bills and still have money to spend after that. That is a surplus. In the 90s, we are out of debt. We're what we call in the black. For the first time in 30 years. Clinton's deficit reduction coincides with a boom in the technology industry. So the reason for the surplus is more a combination of Clinton's policies and a rise in technology. This is the 1990s. We get the rise of the internet, 
personal computers, gaming machines, all kinds of other things. The rise in that technology means more people are going to want to buy that stuff. More people buying those products increases the need for jobs. More people getting jobs, more money going into the economy, and so on and so forth. And this leads to the longest sustained era of economic growth in American history. However, many of Clinton's conservative policies are really in response to Republican control of Congress, because Clinton knows that in order to get these bills passed, he has to have the support of Congress, and he also knows they're the opposite party, so that could prove difficult. Two years into Clinton's first administration, Republicans take control of the House of Representatives for the first time since 1994 and they named Georgia Congressman Newt Gingrich as their Speaker of the House. And the Speaker House is the leader of the House of Representatives. Gingrich pushes for what he calls a contract with America. He wants to create a balanced budget amendment, which is an amendment to the Constitution requiring that a state cannot spend more than it, its income. So it requires a balance between protect, projected receipts, or money coming in, and expenditures, which is money going out, in that particular state. He also wants tax cuts because less taxes means more money in the people's pockets, which could then lead to better economy. He agrees with Clinton's welfare reform. But he also wants tougher crime laws. If you commit a crime, he wants you to be punished more fairly, in his opinion. The clash between Clinton and Gingrich leads to a government shutdown in 1995. And the shutdown is basically when all non-essential government agencies are not working. And the government doesn't fund anything until they come to a resolution. Uh, the most recent one that we've seen in our time is in the Trump administration when he shut down the government for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks over funding for his border wall. The 1995 shutdown was over multiple things like funding for education, the environment, and public health, and it lasted for somewhere around 30 days almost, so right around a month total. There was two separate shutdowns, one from November, uh, one in November and one in de December and January of 96. Clinton uses this rivalry with Republicans, though, very tactfully to win re-election in 1996. While in office, Clinton also signs the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, which reduces trade barriers between the United States, Mexico, and Canada. And the purpose of this was to help boost the economies of those three nations and reduce tariffs or taxes on imports and exports that are going between those three countries. This would help all three nations, but got criticism from many Americans. The fear was especially in the early to mid-1990s when the cocaine epidemic is raging in the United States, they're afraid that drug cartels are going to send their drugs into the United States and end up getting more and more people addicted, and that the United States is just going to send all their toxic waste and bad stuff that they don't want to Mexico and harm them. So they're really just afraid more of the bad stuff that's going to go in and out of the U.S. as opposed to the good that can come with the economy from this agreement. During his presidency, Clinton also commits many U.S. troops to peacekeeping efforts throughout the world. And this is extremely important because the 90s is a time of peace for the U.S. We're not actually at war with anybody. So in order to keep America on the world stage, he's going to send troops for U.S. peacekeeping efforts. From 93 to 95, U.S. troops are sent to Somalia to offer food and restore their 
country after a civil war. From 95 to 99, U.S. troops are sent to Bosnia. Bosnia is an area in the Balkan area of um, Europe, just across the Adriatic Sea from Italy, to stop an ethnic cleansing by the Serbs, and also to Kosovo, which is in that same region, to help stop a civil war. Now, a little bit more background on this is that Yugoslavia is a nation that was thrown together, so to speak, after World War I, and it's made up of many ethnic groups. We've got Catholic Croats who live in the Southwest, Bosnian Muslims in the Southeast, Orthodox Christian Serbs in the North, and they all have like this fight between each other. And some Serbs attempt to massacre Muslim civilians in parts of Bosnia and Kosovo in this idea of ethnic cleansing, almost like a genocide. And their goal was to eliminate the Muslims and take over that land because they feel like it rightfully belongs to them. Because this makes it to the world stage and many Europeans see it as a genocide similar to what Germany did during World War II with the Holocaust, the fear is extremely heightened. So Bill Clinton helps to negotiate a peace in Bosnia and helps restore stability in that area by sending these troops. While he's sending all these troops overseas to help in these peacekeeping matters, there's a huge rise in crime in the United States. And a lot of this stems from a situation in Los Angeles in 1992 after a man named Rodney King was violently beaten by four LAPD police officers after he was being arrested for fleeing and resisting arrest in California. And this whole situation really got brought to the nation's attention because a civilian was filming this situation from his balcony. And the footage clearly shows King being beaten by the police officers thrown on the ground, and the guy who took the footage sends it to the local news station so that everybody can see what's happening. And the incident is eventually covered by news media all over the world. The really big issue comes when those officers are brought up on charges of police brutality, and three of them are acquitted, which means they basically are forgiven. They're not getting any consequences. And the jury failed to reach a verdict on one charge in the fourth. So basically these police officers brutally beat this guy, four white officers against one black man, and they get off scot-free. Within hours of the announcement that the police officers weren't to be charged or weren't to get uh, punished for it, race riots begin in Los Angeles. And it's mostly sparked by outrage among African Americans, not only over the trial's verdict, but also the longstanding social issues that are happening in the country. This only ends after 63 people are killed, over 2,000 are injured, stores are looted, buildings are set on fire, Everything. The violence in Los Angeles also leads to outbreak of violence in many other cities as well for the same tension issues. We also begin to see evidences of terrorism, both foreign and domestic, in the United States. One of those is perpetrated by a Gulf War veteran by the name of Timothy McVeigh and an accomplice of his by the name of Terry Nichols. They had been buddies in the Army 
and they expressed anger at the federal government's handling of the 1992 Federal Bureau of Investigation standoff at, with Randy Weaver at Ruby Ridge, as well as the Waco siege in 1993 with the Branch Davidian members. They don't agree with how the government handles this. And in March of 93, McVeigh visits the Waco site during the standoff. And all of these radical ideas, as well as their hatred, not necessarily hatred, but disagreement with how the government is handling things, leads to them planning the bombing of the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. So when they go to the building that they've planned to bomb, McVeigh carries an envelope with him containing pages from a book called The Turner Diaries, which is a fictional account of white supremacists who ignite a revolution by blowing up an FBI headquarters. And in that book, they blow up the FBI headquarters at 9.15 in the morning. So they originally planned their bombing for later, but McVeigh decides he's going to do it around 9 a.m. instead. And he gets to the building. And at the same moment, as he's going into the building, a lobby camera uh, picks up the recording And he lights a fuse. Three minutes later, a block away, he lights another fuse. And he parks the truck in the drop-off zone situated under the building's daycare center. Um, They had a daycare center which was used by the employees of the building to house their kids. And he goes to the getaway vehicle. At 9.02 a.m., the rider truck containing over 4,800 pounds of fertilizer and basically a homemade bomb detonates. 168 people were killed. Hundreds more of them were injured. And it's a very tragic day because these are Americans. These are soldiers. They're veterans. And they just committed this horrible act. Later in 1999, we get one of the worst school shootings at Columbine High School in Colorado. In this shooting, 13 people are killed, another 23 are wounded, and it's carried out by two kids, Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris, and it becomes the worst school massacre or shooting at that time and the really bad part about it is it sparks a lot of copycats around the nation who are copying what they're doing And while in our modern society, school shootings, unfortunately, are fairly common, this was unheard of in 1999. This is not something that happened. Moving back to foreign affairs, after the Persian Gulf War, Osama bin Laden forms a terrorist militant Muslim organization called Al-Qaeda, and he begins terrorist attacks on the United States. He begins with embassy bombings in Tanzania and Kenya and attacks on USS Cole, which is an American warship. Later, he ends up bombing the World Trade Center in 1993. Bin Laden's intention in this bombing was to detonate a truck in the parking garage just below the North Tower of the World Trade Center in New York City. 
intending to send the North Tower crashing into the South Tower to bring both towers down and kill thousands of people. This plan did not work in 93. He did kill six people and injure over a thousand, but it was not nearly to the extent that we see on 9-11. The Clinton administration is plagued with many scandals. The first one to come out is one that we call the Whitewater Scandal, which is a situation while he was still the governor of Arkansas. And come to find out he had been connected to improper land deals in the time while he was governor. And as the authorities start digging into it, more and more questions become asked. The really big one was during his presidency where he was brought up on charges of sexual indecency. And this led to a grand jury investigation. And the major thing is that he's accused of having an affair with a White House intern named Monica Lewinsky. So he denies having this affair. He adamantly says he did not have relations with her. But there's a guy named Kenneth Starr who's really pursuing Clinton. And he wants to catch him doing something wrong. And Monica bears her soul and says she loves the president and like tells everything about it. And at this point, if the president lies under oath, that's going to cause even more scandal. His wife comes in, Hillary Clinton, and she explains that it's all been conspired by the Republicans. They're trying to tarnish his name. But they do DNA testing, and it turns out he was not telling the truth. So he did lie under oath. And he eventually has to tell the American public that he did have an affair with this White House intern. And at that point, because he did lie under oath, He could be impeached because of subverting the legal system and obstructing justice, as well as getting other people to lie for him. So Congress draws up articles of impeachment. And they do actually impeach him. They vote to impeach him, very similar to what they did with Donald Trump. After a 21-day trial in the Senate, however, he is acquitted, which means he is not convicted and not removed from office. So Bill Clinton is the second president in American history after Andrew Johnson to ever be impeached, Donald Trump being the third, but none of those men were ever removed from office. At this point, it really highlights the partisanship and the conflict in American politics that frustrates many Americans even to this day. So like I said, Clinton becomes only the second president to ever be impeached. He is not removed from office, but at that point he cannot run for office again uh, as president anyway. So the Clinton years during the 90s represent new changes for the nation. The Democratic Party takes back the presidency and becomes much more moderate. The economic boom of the 90s is based largely on technological innovation, and it would end up crashing in the early 2000s in what we call the dot-com boom. And the emergence of terrorism both at home and abroad presents new threats to American security that we will see perpetuate in the 21st century. This brings us to the end of Unit 10, Lesson 1, and I hope you have a great day.